you stand and join us? Let's sing this together. And I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise. They spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. And I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. We'll praise Him, we'll praise Him. Creator God, Your glory fills the skies. And I sing the goodness of the Lord filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how your wonders are displayed wherever I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky. We'll praise Him, we'll praise Him. Creator God, Your glory fills the skies. No praise Him, we'll praise Him. The songs of all creation now Arise. The songs of all creation now or flower below but makes your glories known and clouds arise and tempests blow by permit from your throne while all that borrows life from you is ever in your care and everywhere that we can be you got a present there. We'll praise Him. We'll praise Him. Creator God, Your glory fills the skies. No praise Him. We'll praise Songs of all creation now arise. The songs of all creation now arise. The songs of all creation now arise. During the next song, we're going to um, take communion. So if you're in the center section, which we don't really have sections right now, but there's a table at the front and there's two on either side. And we ask that you just walk around the part where you're sitting and come back to your seat and we'll have a time of private Thanksgiving and we'll take it together after the song. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now the savior knelt to wash our feet now at his feet we bow the one 
Lord who wore our sin and shame now robed in majesty the radiance of perfect love now shines for all to see cause your name your name is victory all praise will rise to Christ our King your name your name is victory and all praise will rise to Christ our King the fear that held us now gives way to him who is our peace his final breath upon the cross he is now alive in me sing this together it's your name your name is victory it's all praise will rise to Christ our King, your name, your name is victory, and all praise will rise to Christ our King. And by your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me and in your name i come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me by your spirit i will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me and in your name i come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me by your spirit i will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me and in your name i come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me the tomb where soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days his body there would not remain our god has robbed the grave our god has robbed the grave Let's sing your name because your name your name is victory and all praise will rise to Christ our King. And your name, your name is victory. And all praise will rise to Christ our King. You can be seated.
the theme that uh, is being worked with right now is joy. And uh, they say repetition is a good teacher. So I know in a couple of weeks or sometime soon, Bob's going to preach about uh, Philippians chapter 2, where it says, your attitude ought to be the same as Christ Jesus, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. We think about that, and, and, it, and it blows our mind, or at least it blows my mind, that um, one would look forward to something miserable and see joy on the other side of it. Uh, this morning, as we participate with uh, the taking of the elements, we are reminded that through this suffering, we die to sin and live to Christ. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, when he had blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, Take, drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, which was shed for you and for many for the remission of sin. Do this as often as you remember me. Lord Jesus, it is a good reminder to us that um, as we consider your suffering, we should also consider your joy. We thank you that your suffering produces joy in us and for us. We thank you that we can come to this place and rejoice that you have, you have provided for us life. Lord Jesus, as we come to you this morning, we just think about the world in which we live. And we ask that uh, you would show yourself worthy and show yourself strong in, in, all of the, um, in all of the weirdness that we see. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would, as you give us your spirit, you would enlighten us to truth and help us be emissaries of truth. We pray for um, all the schools that are open now, and we just pray that you would keep uh, staff and students safe. We pray that you will provide what is needed for, uh, for uh, uh, a good environment in which to learn. And we commit both our students and our teachers to you. We pray that you would bless them. We pray you would encourage hearts. Lord, we pray that you would fill us once again with your presence that we might reach out to others and with joy share with them the hope that is within us. Lord Jesus, we love you today and we offer to you both our worship and our praise. In your name, amen. We stand with us again. Free at last he has ransomed me, 
His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, who is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. And in my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Because I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the Son sets free, who oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Cause I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Let's sing that again. I am chosen, not forsaken, because I am who you say I am. And you are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sign says. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. And in my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. You can be seated. I am glad you're here today. This is good to be in church, is it not? I'm telling you, I love our worship team, our AV team, our children's ministry team, our student ministry team. So many people working together to, uh, to, to share the good news. And we need it, right? We do need it. Our world needs it. And today we're talking about joy and joy always. And from time to time, we all have a bad day. Uh, it really is true, is it not? Here's a couple stories of some people who had epic bad days. There was a, a man in Italy who was driving his car on a mountain road, and a, and a big gust of wind actually pushed his car off the road, and it landed upside down in a river. He was able to break the window and escape this car sinking, but when he got up on shore, another big gust of wind came and knocked a tree over on top of him, and it killed him. That's a terrible, terrible day, right? Right? Yeah, true. It's, it's what I'm telling you, honey. Be careful. Uh, and here's another one. A guy named George Schwartz from uh, Providence, Rhode Island. He owned a factory. One day he's in his, at his job, you know, doing his work, and there's a big explosion. The entire building, building is flattened except for one wall. He suffered some minor injuries when he was released from the hospital. He went back to, the, to his building, you know, and to recover some important files. While he was gathering up those files, that one standing wall, you guessed it, fell over on top of him, and he was killed. I mean, those are epic bad days. Now, if you're listening to this message, you have not had that level of a bad day, right? But, but the, the point is, we all have bad days. 
Sometimes, you know, it's a job loss because of COVID, uh, you know, an economic shutdown, or sometimes it's trying to educate your rowdy kids with poor internet. Like, I know I've heard some of those stories, right? Or, uh, you know, you've just had, you've had a season of, of, of tense relationships with somebody you care about. Like, it's just difficult. And we all have bad days. But through the Holy Spirit, through our relationship with Jesus, we can find joy for even the worst of circumstances. And so here's a, a definition that we'll be using throughout the book of Philippians uh, uh, about joy. Now, if you've downloaded our app, you can go to the bulletin uh, tab and you can, you can find these notes and you can fill in as we go along. But Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he calls us to see the beauty of Jesus Christ in his word and in his work and in our world. And so we're going to be fleshing this de definition out because uh, the book of Philippians contains the word joy or the form of the word joy 11 times, more than any other book that, that Paul or any other letter that Paul wrote. And so it's a major theme. Sometimes people describe the entire book in one word saying the word joy. And so joy is, is, is a, big, a big theme in the book of the Philippians, which we'll explore in different times as we go through the book. But this idea of joy, the Christian word joy, it, it's, it's not a philosophy. It, it's, it's, it's not really a doctrine as much as it is a feeling, a gift produced by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, you know. And, and so the Holy Spirit is, is welling up this joy in this, uh, this non-physical part of who we are, our soul. And it's a feeling that we have. And we can't create it. We can ask for it. We can put ourselves in a place to receive it. But the Holy Spirit does the heavy lifting in creating the joy within our soul. If you're walking through, if you're hiking through the Smoky Mountains and you come across a big hungry black bear, a mama bear, right? You don't say to yourself, I see a hungry black bear in front of me. I think I should feel fear. No, you immediately feel fear, right? You're immediately terrified about uh, meeting this black bear staring you in the face, right? And so, so, so that's the way joy is. You can't think your way into it, but we can put ourselves into a place to receive this joy that is provided to us through the Holy Spirit. And so there are all types of commands throughout the Bible of things that we do, and then God, working through His Spirit within us, creates those emotions and those feelings uh, and, and gives us what we so desperately want, especially on bad days, and that's joy. Uh, Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So I am, just a few moments ago, singing with you, singing, the, I've, I've sang that song three times today already, right? Because I'm, I'm here for all three services, imagine that. Uh, but, but anyway, I, every time I sing that song, you know, I'm a child of God, yes I am, and I feel this joy inside of me, like, I, you know, I'm not defined by my mistakes. I'm not defined about what people say about me. I'm defined by what the Lord says I am, and I'm his child, and so are you. We are sons and daughters of our Father in heaven. And that creates feelings of joy. But if I don't worship, if I don't worship, if I don't, if I don't put myself in the place, gathered in the name or, or, or stand in the place, you know, I've got my earbuds in, and I'm, if I'm not worshiping the Lord, I'm not going to experience that joy because... I'm not putting myself in a position to receive it. And so it's real important that when we face bad days, we know where joy is found. And it's found in the Lord, in the Spirit, as we follow His Word in our lives. <clears throat> the Philippians were concerned about Paul because Paul was in jail, probably in Rome. And, and jails back then were not good things to be in. And Paul's situation w looked very grim. And so they're concerned about their friend who's suffering in jail. And, and, and they want to do all, all that they can to bring him joy. Uh, but uh, they might think that, you know, things have gone terribly wrong because Paul's in prison. But Paul says, no, something 
very different is happening that you don't understand. And so Philippians explains this situation that looks bad on the outside, maybe to people who are who are following Jesus and even the, some of the people at Philippi. And he says, let me correct your understanding. And so beginning to read in Philippians 1, verse 12 and 13, he says, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, know that I am in chains because of Christ. See, Paul, he, his, his whole life, is, is, uh, is focused on the gospel. The gospel impacts his decisions. Uh, the gospel impacts what he's going through. It is the lens in how he views what is happening to him. Joy flows from a life focused on the gospel. And when I was a young teenager, I borrowed my dad's uh, Pentax SLR camera, you know, and so uh, I was in this photography club at church, and we were taking pictures. And I, different times, made a, a very common error to a novice photographer, and that is you're trying to take a picture, say, of a flower, and you end up focusing on the background and not the image. And then when you get your pictures back, I, so let me explain for some of you. There was this day that you, you took this cylinder out of your camera, and it was called film. It was, it was, yeah, really. And he took it to a place, and that person behind the counter took your film, and a couple days later, you go get your pictures. And then, you know, you have that time where you pay for the pictures, you're waiting, and then you get the picture out, and you're like, where's that picture of that cool flower I took? And, the, and, and it's all blurry, and you've got the background, which is, you know, some trees or something, but, but the image that you wanted to capture was out of focus. And so the point is, like, if we don't so keep, our, keep our mind, our mind's eye, focused on Jesus, we begin to focus on the background or the circumstances in our life, and we begin to lose our joy. Pa Paul kept focused on, the, on Jesus, on the gospel. And the word gospel appears nine times in the book of Philippians, and so it's an important theme in the book as well. And today I'm going to try to, uh, tr try to show how gospel and joy and suffering all work together. Paul is chained to the imperial guards, to the palace guards. These are the, these are the guys that work directly for Caesar. And, and could you imagine being, being a prison guard to the greatest, I think maybe one of the greatest evangelists who ever lived? Like, that would be, like, these guys, you know they heard of Jesus. You know these guys heard stories about Jesus uh, uh, from Paul, and they saw his attitude and, and they were impressed by it. And we come to find out that many of the high echelon people in the Roman Empire become believers, even one of their future emperors as well. And so uh, Paul is advancing the gospel even though he's in prison. And many people, he says to his, the, his, his people back at Philippi, are hearing the gospel because of his imprisonment, and they are emboldened to talk about it. So Paul isn't fretting about being stuck in prison but he's excited that people are finding the Savior because of what suffering he's going through. So if you focus on what's wrong with your job, if you focus with what's wrong with your kids, if you focus on what's wrong with government or what's wrong with society or what's wrong with you, you're, you're out of focus on Jesus. You're focusing on that which won't bring you any joy. And we need to focus on our Savior and the good news because that's where joy flows from. This next story uh, comes from a sister church, Southeast Christian Church. And it's a story about a man named Doug and, and how the gospel impacted his life and brought him joy. If you care about people and you have the power to help, you'll always be busy. I would add to that because God knows where you are and he'll bring you plenty to do. And he's doing exactly that. I grew up in South Dakota in a family where we were uh, uh, Lutheran. We went to church every Sunday, but uh, I can't say that it really took. 
I'd always been told by teachers and such that I was a bright young man, and, and when people used to approach me about Christ or about religion, uh, I guess I used that to deflect. And that kind of intellectual pride and that kind of arrogance uh, held me away from Christ for a long, long time. So when I came here to Louisville, uh, I found a lot of friends through basketball, and one of those friends was a member at Southeast. And he started talking to me about Christ and about my lack of a consistent church attendance and all this. And, and one day, I'll never forget, he, he called and he said, Doug, I've worked on you for a couple of years now. I want you to find Christ, but I haven't been successful. If you can read this book and still have an intellectual argument against the existence of Christ, then I give up. I get, I get a little emotional because it was, it was an emotional moment. He slid across the table a, a copy of the book, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. And what I found in there was C.S. Lewis talking to every single point he'd ever tried to make against the reality of Christ. And he made me realize just how smart I wasn't. And I went back to my friend and, and uh, in tears said, now I get it, now I understand. It changed our whole family. It changed everything that Linda and I were about. If my children were raised by the Doug Michael before Christ, they wouldn't have had nearly the chance in life that they have today embracing Christ and moving forward. So it, it just, what did it change? It changed everything. Well, I had a business career for 40 years and I decided to retire a little bit early. I wanted to have more time free to spend time with my family, but also to find ways to give back. One of the things that's always been on my heart has been, uh, I had a great childhood, but not everybody does. So I found myself naturally in, in raising my own kids. Uh, I would gravitate to their friends who were having challenging times and problems. So I'd always done some sort of informal counseling of troubled kids. As I was nearing retirement, I heard about an organization called CASA, which stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates, where uh, kids who are in family court through no action of their own, usually drugs or violence in the home or some criminal activity, uh, a judge has to make decision in a few minutes with very little information as to what to do with them next. So a CASA volunteer comes up alongside those kids, spends enough time with them to build a relationship and then recommends to the court what might be the next level of disposition. Do they go back to the nuclear family? Do they go to an aunt and uncle? Do they go to an orphanage or residential facility or a foster home, etc.? One of the things, that questions I asked up front was, is this a Christian organization? And they said, well, no, but there's no restriction on you speaking to your own worldviews in your role as a CASA volunteer. And it was important to me. If I don't get in the car and preach to them every time, but I'm able to expose to them because they ask curious questions, who I am, what I'm about, and what I believe. And as such, I'm able to pour my faith into them in, in a, a bit more subtle way than if I had them in Bible study. Some of my friends asked me, you know, you're in such a depressing environment, how do you sustain yourself? Well, I think of the old starfish story. A man stumbles upon a child amongst thousands of starfish on the shore that are gonna die as the sun comes up, and uh, the man says to the child, why do you keep throwing them in the ocean? You can't possibly make a difference. The boy picks one more up and throws it in the ocean. And he says, it made a difference to that one. Every time you encounter a situation where Christ made a difference through you, you come back stronger and more whole and more, more grounded in Christ and more, just, a, just a more satisfied human being. You can see the joy in Doug's eyes, and, and, and to think about what brought him joy is sharing his life that's been affected by the gospel in, people's, in young people's lives who don't have joy because of their home situation. Can you imagine Doug's friend watching this testimony and thinking back many, many years ago when he at the, at the edge of the basketball court, he's trying to convince Doug about Jesus and about coming to church and, and, and the impact and, and I'm sure for Doug's friend, he was probably frustrated. Maybe different times when he's sharing the gospel, he might have felt embarrassed. He, he might have been uh, just kind of mad at Doug and not, not accept. I don't know what the emotions he might have went through. But, but the joy, the struggle that, that comes from, you know, sharing this good news and changing the lives of others. We, we should ask ourselves uh, this, this very important question, I think, 
from time to time, uh, it is this. How can my life's experiences and what I have been through advance the gospel? That's what, that's what happened to Doug. He began to, uh, to, to take what he had experienced in life and frame that through the, through the lens of the gospel, and then it began to make a difference in the lives of other people. And so I don't know what you're going through or what you've been through, but when you consider Jesus, you consider his life, and you consider his call on our lives, how might your experience, bad or good, uh, impact others through the lens of the gospel, through flowing through the gospel? Uh, Peter O'Brien uh, was a great theologian and preacher. Uh, he did not grow up in a Christian home. Uh, his parents didn't go to church, but they lived beside an elderly woman who was dying of a terminal illness and could not leave her home. And so um, Peter's mother would sometimes bring food over for this woman who was you know, just, just in a really bad situation. And she was so impressed by this woman's joyful attitude, even though she was dying of this disease, didn't have much family around, you know, couldn't get out. And it led her to go to church. And she went to church. She received the gospel. She became a believer. Then the husband, Brian's father, became a believer. And then Brian becomes a believer. He goes off to seminary, gets his Ph.D., uh, goes in mission work in India, preaches to thousands of people. Many, many people from that country come to Christ. He goes to Australia. He begins teaching other church leaders there, writes a number of uh, 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 commentaries on the Bible, profound works that, that, that are just still impacting people as they read uh, his studies in, uh, in the Bible. And so if, if you would have gone to that elderly woman and told her, because of the suffering you're going through and the attitude that you show others of this joy-filled attitude, there's going to be thousands of people who come to know Jesus. And, and, and there's going to be um, uh, a groundswell of other church leaders come to understand the Bible better through these commentaries that Peter will write and, and, and go on and on about all the things that were accomplished through this family's uh, uh, following Jesus. She would have responded yeah, I'll go through this. This is no problem. But the truth of the matter is, when we're suffering, we, it's hard for us to keep our focus on how God is going to use this. We pretty much suffer on, we pretty much focus on what we're going through, don't we? That's just, that's just human nature. And that's why, you know, stories like Paul and sermons like this one help us Keep the gospel in focus and not focus on the circumstances that are in the background. And so uh, God's unseen sovereign hand is working through all these situations to bring good out of bad. And as we uh, followers of Christ can, can find joy in knowing that somehow, in some way, the suffering that I'm going through or my family's going through is going to result in good things as long as I keep the gospel in view of all that's happening. So let me just run through a little explanation of the gospel. This is a church word, and it might be new to you, and there's a number of ways to explain the gospel, but let's just use the gospel as an acronym. Uh, G stands for God created us for relationship. Psalms 103, we're the sheep of his pasture. He's designed to have the shepherd sheep relationship with us, to protect us, to care for us. But uh, the problem is that our sins separate and break us from that relationship and break down the relationship to the people that we love around us. And we're separated from God, from others, because of our sin. Salvation, though, is found in Jesus. God had a man and a plan to bring about the redemption of all humankind through this son, Jesus, God in the flesh. And so John 3.16 you probably know that verse, for God so loved the world, right? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. And then this Jesus, he paid our sin debt that we owe. We, because of our sin, we're, we, we, we are gonna, we're either going to pay for it on our own or we're going to let God pay for it through the son Jesus. And everyone who turns to him is saved. Acts 2.38 talks about how uh, these believer, these non-believers, who these Jews who 
participated in the death of Jesus, hear the gospel message. Peter explains to them that the one they put on the cross was the Messiah promised, and they realize that they have killed God, so to speak. They're convicted by their sin. They cry out, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that is what they do, and the church begins on that day in 30 AD. And so <clears throat> then we have one more letter, and that is life eternal for every follower of Jesus. Our life doesn't end here. It continues on with the Father in the new heavens and the new earth, and that is going to be an amazing experience. So here's just one way, right? Here's just one way to share the gospel. Now, you have to come up with your own way. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have, you'll develop your own way. If you keep studying the gospel, keep thinking about how you might share it, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll develop your own, your own style. But everybody should be ready to share the gospel. But it's not easy to do, is it? Like, you could just look back over this past month and ask yourself the question, how many conversations have I had about the gospel with someone? One thing that we could begin to do is just to have a conversation with other believers about the gospel. Like when you come to church, instead of talking about why you're mad at the NFL or why you're mad at this, like you could go, you know, I've been thinking about the gospel. I've been thinking about Jesus' impact on humanity. You could, you could watch some, some teaching on the gospel. You could consider these scriptures that I'm talking about here. And you could begin to dialogue with another believer. And that's easier, is it not, the dialogue with another believer than an unbeliever? You, you know, parents, you can talk about the gospel to your children at night. Uh, grandparents can talk about to their grandchildren about the gospel, you know. So what I'm trying to say is that sharing the gospel is a spiritual battle. Because the thing that is most hated by Satan is any words about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. If there's anything Satan doesn't want anyone to talk about, it's about the good news of Jesus. Like, he hates it. He'll try to well up feelings within us of embarrassment or that we're inadequate to talk about it or, or that they won't listen, you know. And so, so, so constantly we're in this, we're in this struggle when, we, when we're talking about share, whether we believe it or not, it's true. There's a spiritual warfare, warfare existing in the world around us trying to prevent the gospel from being shared. And, and we as, 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 as Christ's you know, advocates to, uh, uh, th of the gospel message, we're, we're, we're caught in this struggle, and we need courage. Francis Chan tells a story about one of the guys on staff there, another pastor at the Simi uh, Church, Cornerstone Church in Simi Valley, California, uh, years ago when he was uh, the lead guy there. And he tells a story about the staff member who was driving to drop their child off at daycare. And, uh, and, and he's following this, this elderly man driving a car, and the elderly man accidentally runs into a cyclist. And the cyclist is knocked off his bike, and he's not injured terribly, but he's furious. The cyclist is so mad. And so all traffic stops. The cyclist gets out. He walks around. He swings the door open, and he begins to beat the 75-year-old man, just begin to pummel him with his fists. And... <clears throat> And this, this pastor, you know, he's watching all this happen, and he's like, I've got to do something. So he gets out, and he pulls the man, the cyclist, off the older, older man, and, and he's trying to stop the fight. Well, then they, they, he begins to hit him. And so this pastor, with one solid uppercut, bam, knocks this cyclist out cold. And, 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 and all the people who are watching this take place, they just, you know, they start clapping, you know. So you're like, good, I'm glad somebody stopped this terrible, violent act taking place. When Francis Chan told that story in his church, they erupted with applause and gratitude uh, for, for one of their staff members taking up the cause of somebody uh, who, who was receiving this injustice. And then Francis Chan says, now imagine, now imagine, you go to a restaurant this evening or this afternoon, and you're sitting in that restaurant, and across the way you see a 75-year-old man sitting alone, obviously depressed, needing to hear some good news. Will you have the courage 
to go into this spiritual battle. See, his question to his church was this. It's easy for us to be courageous about physical things, but it's hard for us to be courageous about spiritual things. But all the physical things will pass away. It's the spiritual things that are eternal. And so, so somehow we have to shift our focus from always about the physical to the spiritual. You know, you know what's far more important than, than the events that are taking, like the outcome of so many events that are, that, that, you know, like the election and, 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 and the COVID thing and all that. What's far greater importance is for people to hear and obey the gospel. That is supreme. That is number one. And so, so we have to have courage to, to get into that fight. And so perhaps our failure to talk about the gospel to unbelievers is our lack of talking about the gospel to believers. So before the day's out, before the day's out, before this day ends, I want you just to have one casual conversation with your spouse or your child or, or your brother or your sister who's a believer. At, talk to a friend and just say, can I just wing it like my way of explaining the gospel for you? Just try it. Just try it. And so I'm sure everyone's going to have an awkward conversation, but that's where it begins. It begins with a little practice with people that, uh, that we're not afraid of. And, and so my guess is before the day's out, some of you are going to send me a text and say, yeah, I did that. You know, it's amazing. So Paul, Paul continues to write in Philippians. He says, he says, and because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. You see, his suffering was emboldening other people to, to talk about Jesus. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. <clears throat> they preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. Here we see the word joy twice in one verse. Why? Because the gospel is being preached. Why is it being preached boldly? Because he is suffering in prison, and he's not really worried about the motives of people, why they're doing it, like for personal gain, or even uh, maybe even talking about Jesus in a bad way, like at least the conversation of Jesus is taking place. You know, when Jesus is crucified, on that day, the number one evangelist was Pilate. Hear me out. Pilate creates a sign that says, here's the king of the Jews, and he nails it to the cross. Nobody else was saying that that day. Was Pilate doing that for some pure motives? Was, was Pilate wanting to honor Jesus? No. Pilate was really mocking the Jews that they had wanted to, that they crucified their king. And, 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 and so it might have been a joke to him, or it might have just been like a little payback for all the trouble the Jews caused him on a regular basis. But on that day, the one evangelist that was there was Pilate. And so so sometimes people are talking about Jesus and, and their motives aren't pure or they might not be, you know, the right. But at least Jesus is being talked about. And people are emboldened because they see Paul is, is, is in, in, in prison for this purpose of sharing the gospel. So suffering for sharing the gospel produces joy. That Paul, we see, has this joy. And it gives courage to others. Here's a a catalog of some of the things that Paul went through to share the gospel. He, you can find this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, I've been in prison frequently, been flogged severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and, and in danger from false believers. I've labored, I've toiled, and I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst, and I have often gone without food. I've been cold, and I've been naked besides everything else. 
I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Now, I hope none of us would ever go through any of those types of hardships. But aren't we, aren't we saying something like this? This little conversation that happens in our mind when somebody's talking, some preacher's up there talking, you know, like, man, if Paul can go through that, I think I can handle a little rejection at the lunch table or the coffee machine tomorrow at work or school, right? Like, I think I can handle a little bit of that, you know, resistance for sharing the gospel. I mean, I hope we don't go through hardships like that, but what I do recognize is that people who go through hardships are often some of the best advocates and preachers of Jesus. And the thing that fascinates me so much about Paul is his joy was not diminished from all the suffering and hardships he went through. Actually, there's this ripple effect that goes out and to countless others, and they begin to share the gospel. Years ago, Jim Elliott and four of his friends go down to South America to present the gospel to indigenous people who lived in the jungle. One tribe was called the Akura tribe, and they tried over and over again to make contact with these people. Finally, one day, they fly a small plane into a, a little clearing area where they begin to uh, converse and, and, and share gifts with the Akura Indians. Well, they were terrified of them. They were threatened by them, and they take their spears, and they kill all four men right there on the sandy soil of that river deep in the jungle. Their wives and their children are back at the mission camp, and when they find out what, what happened, well, what did they do? They got on a plane. And they went back to that same jungle, and they began to develop a relationship with them so that they could find Jesus. It was such a moving story that it began a, 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 a go national and then international about what these missionaries had suffered through and how the wives remained and began to share the gospel. And now many people know Jesus because of those women who remained the evangelists to the tribe of people, even though their husbands even though the, these were the murders of their husbands. And so his son still goes around the, the world today telling this story and other stories related to it about the hardships of sharing the gospel, but the great joy that comes from that. And so uh, after that story was shared initially, there was a whole group of young college students at Wheaton College that went into the missionary field. We would think it would be just the opposite. You know, like, man, I might die in sharing the gospel. I'm not doing that. No, just the opposite when it comes to Jesus. It emboldens us to be more courageous, to share the good news, because we want other people to know Jesus, know the joy that we have, that they need, right? And so, so I, I just, I think it's so important for us to, to, to ask ourselves, you know, like, Holy Spirit, give me that courage so I can share that good news, so I can experience those moments that, that, that I read about in the scripture, that I hear about, like the joy that comes through this. Now, what I'm about to share to you was revealed to me by the Holy Spirit, and it means a lot to me because I've struggled this week of putting these three words together in some type of an equation that's understandable. And it's this idea of gospel, suffering, and joy. Like, how does it all fit together in Paul's life? And, and here's what the Spirit revealed to me. The gospel is the only means by which our suffering can be turned to joy. The gospel is the only means by which our suffering can be turned to joy. There are people who are suffering for all kinds of reasons, maybe their own choices. But if their life is focused on the good news of Jesus Christ, then whatever they're going through will be turned to good. And whatever they're going through can, can not only embolden other believers, and whatever they're going through can bring joy into their life. And it's just so profound to me to think that, that God can take what we would consider awful or worthless and turn it to something priceless. Back in the 1600s, back in those days, alchemists, people who were working with chemicals and metals, were trying to turn the worthless substance of lead into gold. It was thought that they could turn, with a certain process, they could take lead and turn it into gold. Guess what? They never figured that out. They never figured that out. But here's what we know from looking at Paul's life. This, this, this base suffering that we go through, this awful kind of thing that we go through, becomes priceless 
when the gospel transforms it. I, I'm telling you, if you could just, just contemplate this thought that the gospel is the only means by which I can take all the suffering and turn it to joy. And actually, we're not the one turning it, are we? It's, it's the Lord He's turning it. And so Jesus has this moment, two moments that I just want to mention briefly, because one of the ways we can understand joy is to look at when Jesus was sad. There's this moment where Jesus is standing on the edge of Jerusalem looking down at the city, and he says about the people there, the Jews living there, he says, Oh, how I wish I could gather you like a mother hand gathers her children under my wings. It saddened Jesus. It broke his heart to think people would reject their only hope. But then there's this one moment that Jesus is elated. He's so joyful because, because he's talking to a Roman centurion, a non-Jew. And this Roman centurion recognizes that Jesus is a man of authority. He's a king of another empire he doesn't know about. But he's certain that Jesus can heal his servant at home if he just says the word. And Jesus says, I haven't, I, I've never found faith this great in all of Israel when he hears this man's words of believing in him. And so what brings us joy? Is when people hear the gospel, when we obey the gospel, when the gospel begins to just filter out into every aspect of our life. Let's pray. Father God, I just ask you to help us to have the courage to share the gospel. I ask you to help us keep a focus on the good news as it, as it brings a purpose to whatever we're going through. And that there is no greater purpose than the purpose of sharing the gospel in this life. And though it may cost us, Father, you'll redeem that. You'll redeem whatever that is, and you'll bring good to it. And just like, just like the story we watched today uh, of this man who, who, who eventually accepted the gospel, and now he's, he's bringing that good news in the lives of broken teenagers. Lord, it, it's so true for us. We, too, have circumstances that you're going to use to bring good. Lord, help us. Help us to be your evangelist. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we finish out this worship time with one more song, if you'd like to have another conversation about anything we talked about here, I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to hear your, your words. I'd like to interact with you about any of this that, that has, has, the Holy Spirit is just welling up within your soul. Let's, let's continue the conversation about the good news of Jesus. stand with us again. No height, no depth, no life or final breath could ever separate us from your love. No failure, no mistake, no loneliness or pain could ever separate us from your love could ever separate us from your love and on the other side of everything I'm afraid of you are standing with your arms wide open wide open and even in my deepest doubts and wonder you are standing with your arms wide open, wide open, oh. I'm healed, made strong, I found where I belong. Forever I'm alive now in your love. I'm changed, unchained by your amazing grace. Forever I'm alive now in your love. And on the other side of everything I'm afraid of, you are standing with your arms wide open, wide open, and even in my deepest doubts and wonder, you are standing with 
If I try my best to hide, you know the farthest ocean, you give the morning its light, and I can't run from your presence, cause there's no place that far, so I'll run to you my Savior, there's safety in your arms, and if I make my bed in darkness, if I try my best to hide, you know the farthest ocean, Give the morning its light, and I can't run from your presence, cause there's no place that far. So I'll run to you, my Savior, there's safety in your arms. And on the other side of everything I'm afraid of, you are standing with your arms wide open, wide open. Doubts and wonder, you were standing with your arms wide open, wide open. Oh. Let's go out in confidence, knowing that our God is always there for us. Amen. Thank you for joining us. You can find us on the web at cornerstonechatham.org.